So yeah. Susan, you're our one and only audience person, so feel free to interrupt with questions as things come up okay. because this doesn't And bear with later. us. Okay. Yeah, this is a know what we're we've doing. Done this. Yeah. We've both given this presentation in different venues and different places and with different people. Okay. <laughs> but we done different, it like presentation. Yeah. It's all good. We got this. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as you know, my name's Nikki, um, and I'm here in, in Belgrade tonight. That's where I live. Um, and I certified in 2013, and my certificate area was um, early and middle childhood English language arts and literacy was where I got my certificate. Mine too. You wanna, that's my, that that's my too? certificate as well. Um, but my name is Kim Stout, and I live in Helena, Montana. And I am the current um, union president for the Helena Education Association this year. So on the side, I promote. were fourth grade, right? Well, yes, I taught last year I taught fourth grade. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's right. And before that, I taught first grade for years. And that's why I certified in the early literacy, because I just felt like it really called to me with those little kids. Yeah, that was definitely the focus for what I was doing too. So that was why I chose that certificate. And the generalist certificate, and we'll talk about that more a little bit more, but it was, it required multiple subject areas. And I really just wanted to focus on literacy and language arts. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, are, there we are, and there's our contact information, should you have any questions. And then I created this bit.ly link um, to this slide deck if you want to get on there and see if it works. Um, and then you can either follow along or you have this for to refer to later. Okay. Uh, we are recording so that um, we can go back and look at it later and laugh at ourselves. <laughs> or so that if you want to watch the recording and you know fast forward to pieces that you may have missed or wanted to um, learn more about, you could do that too. Okay. All right, take it away, Kim. Okay, so I don't know, Susan, how much you really know about the national boards. What are you familiar with it at all? Yeah, I've already taken the test. Oh. So last year I started. Um, the principal I had really encouraged me to do it, so I'm like, okay, I'll start with the test. And then I took a class in January or February in Billings. And they said, never start with the test. But that's what I had heard. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I started with the test. I thought I failed it when I took it, so I just quit. I was like, I'm not doing this. If I failed the test, I'm done. And then I got my results, and I didn't fail it, so I thought I would keep going. What did you get on it? Good. I got a three. That's great. That is a great score, especially they just recommend that you don't do the testing component first because they feel like you have a better grasp on the content area after you've done the other components to then do that last component. So, I mean, you're ready to rock and roll if you got a three on the test. Oh, I thought, yeah, I thought I totally bombed it because that's what they said. If you don't know how to write for the national board until you've done like two and three and four and gone through the process and edited it and had someone else read it. So I thought mm -hmm. there's no way that I would even pass the the, um, the the scripted stuff, those three questions. I thought, I'll just try it because I don't even know what the writing for National Board looks like. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I thought I was done, but I'm back in it. Now you're back in Good. it. So now you're looking at your intro. Are you going to do another component this year or are you going to skip a year or? Well, I want to do two, three, and four. I think uh -huh. I already have four um, kind of done. I just have to write it. And mm. then um, I have ideas for two and three. And um, yeah, so I was going to try and do three. Just do mm. one and then do three. Uh, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. You can. <laughs> so this is a slide just kind of talks about what the national board for, for, for professionals teaching standards is like where it came from, um, how it's evolved. And it's really just trying to make sure that um, people are recognized for their accomplished teaching and being um, an accomplished educator. Because every student does deserve to have someone who is an accomplished educator to teach them. 
So, and this process is totally voluntary, obviously, you don't have to do it, but it was designed by teachers for teachers. So that's what's really cool about it. They designed it, they developed it, developed it, and then it's in hope to retain teachers along the way. And there's like a certification for pretty much everyone in K-12 education. Like there's so many different certificates and we'll go over that later as well. Um, these are just some key facts um, about national, and I don't really, don't, I don't think that I need to read these all to you um, by any means, <laughs> but you can read through them and kind of see what the, what the national boards stand for. And Susan, I'm guessing you've probably done a, a quite a bit of research on the process prior yeah. to getting started, is that yeah. right? Yeah. What certificate are you pursuing? The um, PE for the younger, like three through twelve year old. Okay. Oh. Cool. Oh, that's gonna. That's a hard one, isn't it? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I commend you. <laughs> so here's cert board certification by the numbers. You can see how many teachers across the nation have um, achieved board certification, and how many are working towards it. We had a fair number of Montana teachers um, submit all their components this last cycle and a number of them did not pass. Um, so you can see how many we have in Montana. Um, the NBCT leaders, those are people like Nikki and I that talk to people about it. Um, there are people who facilitate and help you through the process. Jumpstart is it's a three-day process. Did you you didn't go to Jumpstart in Billings or Missoula? No, I signed up for the Billings one, and when I thought I failed my test, I didn't go. Okay, um, I would highly suggest going to Jumpstart uh, if you don't submit all your components this spring. They really go through all the different pieces and parts of what is required, and. Um, it's kind of like just unpacking all those standards and then you can also meet other people around the state who might be working in the same certificate area and then you can have someone to work with. Not that you can't do it by yourself. I completely did my whole entire certification by myself and it was okay. It's just kind of fun to have someone to bounce ideas off of. And then that home stretch that they have on there is um, something that they're looking into doing to help people get through the end part of the submission process. So like in the spring, get people together and how do we submit, how do we upload our stuff? And um, it's a push to the end to get everything done. And then the ambassador program is basically kind of what Nikki and I are doing. We talk to people about it and get people involved in the process and encourage others to become national board certified. So that's kind of a nutshell of what's going on in Montana. This slide shows kind of where the clusters of teacher, where the te clusters of teachers are, the highest number of cities that have the most number of board certified teachers. And we're looking to grow that into those outer regions where you can see there are none. none. Yeah, but it's none. interesting because actually Belgrade School District doesn't show up on here, but I think last time I looked, Belgrade School District had more than the Bozeman School District. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I should ask Marco if he'll update the slide then. Yeah, and, and just add that. And let's maybe he's combining Bozeman and Belgrade. That could be. But but I want to say there are quite a few more in the Belgrade district. But well, but yeah, we did have quite a few people go for it this last year and, and then we had some some people that didn't quite get it this last time. But we mm -hmm. had quite a few that did though too. I think we only had two. Mm, only two that did. Okay. Yeah. So it is hard. <laughs> it is. No. It's hard for the weak at heart. No. It is. And it's hard. And especially if you're doing it alone. And like him said, I did it alone too. So I was just the only person in my district that even knew what it was. Um, but I did have, I reached out to Marco and asked for some people that might be interested in reading my stuff. And so he actually sent me information for teachers in it was one in Great Falls and one in Billings that I communicated with via, communicated with via email during the process mm -hmm. and sent them my stuff and they read and gave me some feedback. Um, and that was really helpful. Um, and then I had a friend who taught in Arizona who had gone through the process and she read my stuff and gave me a lot of great feedback too. So it's really nice to have people mm -hmm. that 
along the way. Kim, did you have anyone read your stuff or give you feedback? Um, I had just had Jane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that was it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Susan, obviously, we could talk about why certify, but why do you want to certify? Like, what is your interest in National Board? I think it just forces me to look at what I'm doing and become a better teacher instead of status quo and doing what I'm doing. I've really pushing the envelope of what's expected and then trying to meet a higher standard for my students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's great. And that's exactly what these next Y Certify slides are about. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's why teachers want to certify. Mostly it's to improve their practice. Um, but also there's a fair amount of research now that shows that kids who are taught by National Board Certified Teachers um, do better in school or higher achieving students. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, I love this quote that I don't know if you can see it because it's kind of covered by the little people boxes, but I cried, I smiled, I laughed. I thought that was like perfectly describes <laughs> the process because it can be very emotional because it's just you reflecting on your work in the classroom and then you know, presenting it to someone for feedback and um, sometimes I had, you know, a moment where my, I sent it to my friend in Arizona and she had been trained to coach teachers in Arizona. They have a really strong ambassador program. And she wrote back with, I know you feel like you're done, but you're not, you know, there's so many places where the evidence isn't strong enough. And I just remember falling to my knees <laughs> and just being like, but no, I thought I was done. Totally. Um, and I, but that was really kind of like that moment where I, I really did turn things around and I saw things in a different way just because she provided me with that little bit of feedback. Um, and I really always say that I just haven't been the same since. Like I, I went through the process. I had the, the downhearted frustration of submitting and not having it, not getting it on the first try and having to do it again. Um, but then I really, when I submitted that second time, I was really confident that I had it and that I had learned what I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. It was really powerful. Um, the cool thing that happens when you become a National Board Certified Teacher in Montana, I think you saw there are only 141 of them in the state, um, which out of, I think there might be, what, 5,000 teachers in the state? I'm not really sure. Um, mm -hmm. That is still a handful of teachers. And so you do get called upon a lot for different leadership opportunities. Um, doing things like this or being invited um, to present at conferences or, or share your expertise on uh, committees or being a part of um, a leader within the union if you're a member of the union like Kim is. Um, and so it, not only are you a better teacher, but you're also a, get the opportunity to be a role model to other teachers as well. So the teacher continuum, Kim and I both have mixed feelings about this slide <laughs> because it, it, it sort of presents it like, like your teaching career is linear. And I don't think that it is. I think that we, mm -hmm. I think more of a cycle, you know, you, you become a teacher and you, you get kind of confident in what you're doing. And then that leads you to national board certification. And the next step isn't necessarily teacher leader. <laughs> I think, um, a lot of teachers stay in the classroom for quite a while after they become board certified. I think I was, yeah, if I certified in 2013, I didn't step away from the classroom until 2017. So I had a good five school years I spent in the classroom and I did other things. You know, I presented at conferences and I worked on different committees and um, got really active in, in different uh, areas, but it was still very much rooted in my classroom instructional work. And, um, and now I guess I would call myself teacher leader and, and working as a coach to other teachers. But uh, that was something I chose to do and wanted to do, but there are plenty of board certified teachers that are still working <laughs> with students in their classroom. So that's why I feel like this doesn't, doesn't act, it kind of misleads you to think that, oh, you're done in the classroom as soon as you become board certified. <laughs> and that's not well, the case. And I think some people are teacher leaders before they come, become board certified too. Like, so yeah. you could also skip, skip a step mm -hmm. and then go backwards too, so. Yeah. Some people find national board certification as part of their teacher leadership process. For sure. mm -hmm. So Kim, I'll let you talk about the five core oh, propositions. So Susan, I'm guessing you probably know a little bit about these core propositions since you've already done one of the components, but there technically are five and all the components are set around these five core propositions. Um, and 
they basically, you can just see them, number one, their teachers are committed to their students and their learning. And Nikki, if you skip to the next slide, it kind of talks a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm. um, teachers are committed to their students and their learning. They're recognizing what's going on. They're understanding how their students learn um, and creating lessons that are going to get them where they need to be. So that's proposition one. Two, um, teachers know the subjects that they teach and how to teach those subjects. That is where a lot of the reflection piece um, comes on in. Like this, this, these components are so reflective because that's all you're doing. You're, you're videotaping yourself and then you're reflecting on it. Well, how did I do? What went right? What went wrong? What could I do better? What went well? Like that's all you're talking about. And then the hardest part is showing, like Nikki said, that evidence. Like where do you, where does it say that you did what you wanted to do in the lesson? So um, knowing your students and how to teach this um, subjects are, are tough. Um, teachers are responsible for managing and monitoring student learning. That assessment piece is huge in national boards um, and making sure that you're meeting those goals that you set and that you have to show evidence for that. And, I really suggest when you do do all of the components that you really do make sure that you save every little piece of every evidence that you can because you don't really know what you're going to need when it comes down to the actual submission part. Okay. Because you don't want to be shortchanging yourself and be like, oh, that was a great thing, but I didn't save anything. And Susan, oh, Kim, Susan was sharing with me she plans on doing this work with her, her kids in PE where she's having them film themselves performing different skills multiple times. I think that's so awesome. <laughs> um, Self-assessment of those skills and whether they met those goals. So that's a great example of the evidence that you're yeah. to use. Um, and if there's some kind of a goal setting sheet that the kids fill in their goals over time, that would be mm -hmm. a great piece of evidence to include in your- uh, Absolutely, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, number four, you think systematically about your practice and learn from your experience. That's just another piece of that feedback and how you're positively impacting those students and, and getting them where they need to be. And then um, members of learning communities, that's the PLC, the collaboration part. How do you collaborate with your other um, coworkers and um, work together to, with families and community? which I think that piece can also be hard for the evidence. Um, right, I, I had no teachers that struggled with that. With mm -hmm. We collaborated on something. Now, each person had to provide evidence that their students achieved something based on that collaboration. Um, and that's tricky to, to bring mm -hmm. them all and to work through what that looks like. Yeah, I, I think that is tough. It's, I mean, obviously it's not impossible, but it's just, you have to really think about what is going to show the best work. Yeah, and that's where if you're keeping your data, you know, if you've got a pre and post assessment system in place already, or you've mm -hmm. got, you know, you've, you've got a benchmark where they started and then you can apply your participation in this learning community and then prove how they improve based on your participation. That's, yeah. that's what you need to do. And then next. And then the architecture, did you skip? Yeah, architecture of um, instruction of accomplished teaching. So the five core, core propositions go into every single lesson and every single unit that you ever do. And you start at the bottom and you think about who your students are and you pre-assess and you work with them and you get them to get to their goals and they learn and they go all the way to the top and you assess them and you see what they assess, what they learn from your assessment and then you go all the way back to the bottom and you start again. This is just what you do every day in, all, in your regular teaching. And this little helix here basically describes it. Mm -hmm. And I loved this when I first saw it because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it's like, you know, I mean, you have to slow down in the moment and find, you know, attach each task to, the, to that visual. But um, to me, that made perfect sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. And how the five core propositions di directly in integrate with that helix. Mm -hmm. It's helpful, very helpful. Yeah. So in addition to the, the five core propositions, I mean, you really focus on the standards. And so each certificate area has its own set of teacher standards. And these were created by teachers by the National Board for Teaching Standards. Though that little booklet, if you print it off, or if you've got a digital copy, that really becomes your Bible <laughs> during this process. Mm -hmm. 
and in your job is to weave the language of those standards into your portfolio because you're you're really tasked with proving that those standards exist in your day-to-day -day teaching and so if you haven't already the first thing you need to do is just commit those standards to to your heart and your memory and um i i went through them and had sticky notes all over them with you know things that there were already there and what the evidence of those standards would be um I don't know why it's not turning. Here we go. So to be eligible, um, as you know, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Did I skip? Yeah, I keep skipping to the certificate area. So you've already chosen your certificate area. You're doing this physical education, early middle childhood, ages three to 12. This one right here, Susan, um, which makes sense because um, that's where you spend most of your day, right? Yeah. Because um, it wouldn't have made sense for you to go to generalist um, because you would have had to try and include things you weren't teaching, right? <laughs> um, so these are all the different options for where you could find your certificate. And really it's about finding where you're teaching. Um, Kim taught me that when you recertify, it needs to be within the same place where your certificate was. So um, when you every five years you recertify and the process in the recertification costs less money and it's not as labor intensive. Um, but you do have to be working in the in a similar setting. Okay. Um, I can't remember if this was me or you. Oh, yep, this is me. So yep. you have a bachelor's degree and at least three years of teaching experience and a state license. Um, and then I imagine if you're getting the PE one, you probably have to prove your teaching PE and <laughs> some kind of a verification from your principal that you are employed. <clears throat> they also recommend, and I'm sure you've done this, letting your principal know that you're doing this um, so that any decisions about maybe reassignment to different grade levels or different schools or whatever is could maybe be put on hold while you're going through this process. Um, because if you start in one certificate area, you don't want to switch part the part of the way through. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll let Kim take it away on this one. So the, there are obviously four components, which you know about. <laughs> the first one you've already done, the content knowledge, where you took the test and you wrote the essays. Then you have a differentiated instruction component, the um, teaching practice and learning environment, and effective and reflective um, practitioner. And these are all due in between April and May these components are. Whereas the, the, not, the test could be taken up until like mid-June June or something, you just had to um, set that. But these portfolio entries are all due usually around the beginning part of May now, but it always varies every year. So the content knowledge, you already know, computer-based assessment, um, pedagogy, and short response. Differentiated instruction, um, you're talking about student um, strengths and the needs and then how can you get them to where they need to be. The or, uh, um, portfolio is based on student work and demonstrating um, growth over time. So like when I did mine, I had, I, mine was a written piece. So I had a, my student write uh, a story and then over six weeks of writing instruction, I had to see, I had to show the progress that she made over that amount of time. And this it was just one, student samples. Yeah. So yeah you many samples, but you just had to record mm -hmm. one work sample per student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did that too. And you'll have to look to for your specific, like you might have to be like a small group and not just one student, but normally that's just one or two students that you show growth over time. Where then component three is typically a video recording of a small group or a class. And then you write about what happened during that lesson and you refer to the video as in ev evidence showing what happened during the video, what worked, what didn't work. And that is the, the one that we really have to reflect on how you did. Mm -hmm. so one, Cause like when you're writing for national board, the process is to describe, analyze and reflect. And within the video, it's really easy to just describe. <laughs> yeah. It and is you have to catch yourself doing that and analyze, meaning show where you see the national board standards in your teaching um, and explain your instructional decision making 
and then reflect about what happens next, um, what, mm -hmm. what will happen next time. And the video part is hard because it's hard to get, you have to have 15 minutes of continuous unedited footage. And it's hard to get the voices of the students to come up in the video. It's hard to get your voice to come out. I, th I threw away a lot of footage yep. because I didn't, you couldn't hear what, what you were supposed to hear. Mm -hmm. So I, I was telling someone just recently, you just get a camera and set it up for over the course of several days and just try to first to get the kids used to being filmed and to get used to having the camera there. Um, but then it gives you a lot of choices when it comes to the footage that you want to use. Yeah. In a PE setting, it will be interesting because you've got a very no noisy environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, a very echoey <laughs> room. Yeah, that's the biggest problem is the big space. Yeah. To be able to, you might want to mic kids up if you have a tech department that might have microphones. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that's available to you guys over there. I do have one set of lav mics that go with an iPad. Um, and I don't even know if that is really doable in gym either. Like that is a whole nother, you'd have to test that out. I mean, yeah. but it is going to be hard to get that yeah, and depending on it, maybe what you film is you working one on one with the student too. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. your, your sound. Yeah. I was, yep, I was thinking of doing um, like a small group, like stations and working um, like mm -hmm. a motor learning lab. That's part of my component board that I'm working on, like the collaboration piece and community, um, mm -hmm. parent and community, and then doing a motor learning lab in class with the station. Mm -hmm. Then having a microphone there that's right by the recorder and then talking mm -hmm. to the students and having that be kind of where I record from for one of them. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think I ended up filming a, a small group work as well. And it was, I was with them for a little bit and then I got up and walked away and got some nice student discussion around the content as well. Mm -hmm. But in a noisy classroom, that, I mean, <laughs> I had to have everybody else on really quiet independent tasks in order to get that. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, it is hard. Oh, I went too far again. There we go. And then the component four, effect, effective and reflective practitioner, we have to have just oh, demonstrating practices, collaboration. That's a hard one sometimes for people to show evidence of how you're collaborating with families and community and colleagues. So make sure you save every email, every correspondence you send out and all of that because that can be counted as evidence. Um, and then contributions to the learning communities that are gonna advance student growth. Like, do you have someone coming in to help you teach a skill? That would be getting community involvement and advancing student growth. Mm -hmm. that nope, that's me. Scoring. So the scoring happens every summer and then there the scores are released by they say December 31st. Oftentimes they're before that. Um, when Nikki and I did it we found out in November that the last few years it's been closer to mid to late uh, to December. It just depends on when people can, when they can get everything all um, sent out. Um, board certified teachers are people, are the people who score each certificate area. And if you are a cert, if you're a scorer, then you've gone and taken the training that's like a week long and they tell you to, I mean, they show you how to get rid of bias and, and all of that stuff. So it's all on the up and up and everyone is scored exactly the same. Um, so you're, you're scored by your, your fellow peers, which sometimes I think that almost makes it worse. <laughs> it's okay. like when you don't fail, when you don't pass, you're like, oh, my friends think I'm crappy, but you know, it's, <laughs> it is, it just, it's a tough process. Mm -hmm. And um, the national board assessor um, rate is, is, I mean, the national board assessors are, it's very complex. So mm -hmm. I think it would be really fascinating to be an assessor just to see what goes into it. There are two people in Helena who are assessors for national boards. Mm -hmm. I remember I got, I, a few years ago, I got asked to go and do some scoring and I would have had to go to Washington to do it though. Oh. And I just didn't, didn't want to spend a summer in Washington. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, it's time consuming yeah, for sure. If you ask you um, to do that, then after you certify, if you want to help with that, um, it's, but it seems like a really long day to me. Um. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, so timelines, the four components, you can take them in any order and you can take as many in a year as you want. Like some people do them all at once. Some people take one a year, one, one year, two the next year, one another. Um, the bottom line of it though is that you have five years to complete it if you need retakes. Um, when Nikki and I did it, you had to do it all in one year. And if someone starts like in the um, spring and in the fall doing it, I just say, get it all done. I mean, you have enough time to do it. Uh, there are actually fewer components and fewer requirements now than when Nikki and I certified mm -hmm. oh, wow. back in 2013. Mm -hmm. Like we had to do two videos, um, the written work and then the accolades and then the test. Mm -hmm. oh, so there. We had a session called Documented Accomplishments, mm -hmm. which it had to be evidence of things you did outside your classroom teaching and you had to prove that they led to student achievement mm -hmm. for me that and also was, the brought in the community and yeah, yeah. and that one was a, a a gut check for me with wow all this extra stuff i'm doing i can't prove it leads to student achievement mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah so maybe i shouldn't do it <laughs> yeah. um, and it and it really did make it like help me draw a hard line and prioritize things. And I, I learned to say no, because it was like, no, I can't prove that my students are achieving because of my, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of a powerful moment for me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. An eye opener. Yeah. Um, so these are our deadlines. I think we talked a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. um, and at, you'll get regular communication from the national board when you register about these deadlines and things like that. Um, they're not too hard and fast. And I'll let you, I think you were on this one, Kim. Am I on this one too? Yeah, I think I spoke on the last one. I wasn't supposed to. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> so this is how much it costs. It's $4.75 per component plus the $75 annual fee. So you paid the $75 to sign up and then $475 for the component that you took. If you do all of it in one year, you can see it's 1,975, but if you break it up and you do a few and a few, then you have to add that 75 each year. So if you decide to do one more component this year and submit in this spring, you're gonna have to pay the $75 again. And then if you do the other two, then it's 475 times two, and then the $75. You get 60 um, renewal units for completing national boards. And there's most school districts offer some sort of stipend. I don't know if you live, you said you teach in Livingston? Yeah. So does living, do you know if Livingston has a, like a stipend or something they give you if you get board certified? It's 5% of your base salary. 5% of your base salary. Okay. So then you would get that um, in addition to the other Montana support that we're going to talk about here in a minute. And here it is. <laughs> so in Helena, I get a $2,000 stipend on, on my contract. Because of this legislation that happened two years ago now, I can get an additional thousand dollars from the state every year, not just once every year because I'm board certified. Now, if I taught in a, in a high needs school, then I could get $2,000 because they'll match up to a thousand dollars. Oh, wow. So I don't know if living, so you'd have to look up on the website um, because I don't know all the schools in the state that have that um, title. It's not necessarily title. It's not necessarily free and reduced. It's more of a high needs type situation. The state will match every year, and people get confused on this. It's not just a one-time thing. It's every year you will get an additional stipend from the state. It's not pensionable. It doesn't go towards your retirement, but you still get it. So if you get $1,500 from um, on the top of your base salary and you work in a school that has um, a high needs identified, then you can get another $1,500. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, wow. And do you get something no matter what from the state because you did it or it's only if your district has an incentive? You get you get at least five hundred dollars no matter what. Okay. Every year. Okay. For five years. That's the life of your certificate before you have to do maintenance of certificate. They don't really call it renewal anymore. It's called a maintenance of certificate. Mm -hmm. Um, which is they haven't actually said what the maintenance of certificate is yet because no one is there yet. Nikki and I, I think will be on the second cycle of maintenance of certificate. Mm -hmm. Did you know that, Nikki? No. I thought yeah. we were 10 years. Well, yeah, we are, but when our 10 years is up, then we go to a five year. We go to a five year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's provided I can even recertify because I'm not in a. Condition. You can borrow a classroom, though. I would probably have to borrow a classroom. Yeah, you'd have to, I, yeah, you'd have to borrow a classroom. Yeah. Mm hmm. So yeah, so this is, and actually Kim and I weren't grandfathered into this either. We both certified and we were given a one-time stipend mm -hmm. from the $3,000 um, in addition to whatever our school districts were offering. My district just had a lane that we could move into on the salary schedule. Um, and so we didn't get to benefit <laughs> from this, but I guess maybe we will once we, maintain, once we maintain. Yep, once we do our maintenance, we'll get the stipend. So anyone who certified new as of last year mm -hmm. got this stipend. But if you already had your board certification, you have to wait until you renew or maintain your certificate to get the extra stipend from the state. Mm -hmm. so, good to know. All right, so this is some, some systems of support. We talked a little bit about Jumpstart and this is a, a professional development created and taught by national board certified teachers for national board certification, highly recommended that you go ahead and do this either in Billings or in Missoula. Um, this These are the updated dates. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it's really going to take you, take you deep into the standards, deep into what the writing needs to look like. It'll give you a cohort of people that are, are going to be doing this in the state as well to reach out to and connect with. Um, and we just are really, really promoting that this be, be just something you plan on doing if you mm -hmm. want to. Um, you probably know how to register, I'm guessing, if you already took your assessment. So you're probably already in this system and have paid your $70, $75 fee. And, um, and then you paid probably for that first component when you did it. And so then you just do your individual components when, um, when you register and you could still um pay for a component um it has to be paid for by january 31st if you wanted to submit one this spring because it's not due until end of april beginning of may yeah you can decide mm -hmm. another plug for jumpstart and We've come to the end with our contact information and now we can answer any burning question you have um, for us about what, <laughs> what this process might look like. Well, I was, um, I don't know, just the process that I was going to talk with um, Nikki on Wednesday just about what I have and just, I have a couple people that would read. There's a lady in Livingston, um, Gretchen Burlingame at Eastside who just certified so it's going to have her read my stuff the lady here in Bozeman um, if even if you're not in my subject area you know how to write so that would be mm -hmm. really that's the most important thing I did not know Gretchen certified that's yeah she came from New Mexico where they got 15,000 for being nationally board certified yeah she's like, I don't even, she said it's not even like if she would have known coming to Montana what it was she may not have finished <laughs> yeah but she just i think she just it was either she either just passed or she passed a year ago oh, so she sad. said she would look at my stuff and really she just said the same language of um what's your evidence how do you analyze it and how are you reflecting on it like how does that follow the, the spiral and always coming back and really being able to show your evidence yeah mm -hmm. It's almost better to have someone who's not in your certificate area read your stuff anyway, because then they can be, it's more like, did you show this? Does this make sense? You know, someone who teaches the same thing as you just, oh yeah, I get it. But mm -hmm. someone who doesn't, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they almost question a little bit more like, oh, maybe you could elaborate on this more. Yeah. yeah. I agree. So there are 12 standards. I'm trying to look at for component two, three, and four, what those standards are and kind of how they overlap in each one. Mm -hmm. um, when it says you only have so much, like there's specific forms you have to fill out, mm -hmm. like I should be filling those out now and like saving them into my files so I know I have them. And then as I progress, keep going. And when you said evidence, I should then like you can upload as much evidence as you want, like for my component four, where I'm doing a, um, like trying to go across three different schools with the motor learning lab and trying to say, when they come into kindergarten, we have no way to assess kids for their motor learning that then would affect their classroom um, success. Like how can we do a motor learning assessment through PE and then have that, um, follow them into the classroom and then we're working on their motor learning in some way show data that that's helping in the classroom. I think that's the data I'm not sure how to how to really show it's working. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, maybe it's a an evaluation that teachers fill out for you. Um, if you came up with a little three, two, one uh, evaluation that teachers might do it at the beginning of a six week period and then at the end of a six week period. Um, and you might give them three things to, to really look for in students as they're moving around in their classroom. Um, and that would give you maybe some evidence of application. What do mm -hmm. you think? What do you think, Kim? Yeah, I agree. The application piece is gonna be huge. Mm -hmm. So you can show that you taught it, did they learn it, did they apply it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there may be some limitations about how much evidence you can put. I know we had like page number, page restrictions within yeah. our um, portfolio entries. And so we'd have to look at your individual portfolio requirements and okay. see, you know, you're allowed a certain number of pages for the write up and then a certain amount of pages for your evidence. So, um, because obviously they can only read so much, <laughs> the wow. assessors. Um, and so you can't, I think I could only re apply, you know, a certain number of work samples, I think, and um, mm -hmm. a certain number, I can't, there was definitely a page minimum or a page maximum, I mean. I think as I, as, as I go through what I think I'm going to do for two, three, and four and just start writing about it and trying to gather information and then start sending it out to people to say, am I, am I on the right track, I mm -hmm. guess? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's the, the best thing to do, even if you, if you wanna do it section by section, um, then the, it's less to read for those people and so you might get better feedback there. Um, yeah. And so, I. I think that, or however you want to do it, you know, if it's, if it makes more sense to write it all up and then send it off for feedback, I think that's certainly fine too. And the more eyes on it, the better, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't have an, any real questions. Yeah, right. I think it's just, I'm just kind of starting. I need to pay for them, the different components. And then I have, I have my notebook with everything in it. Um, and then, yeah, it's just starting to type it all in in the different forms and just, like, I have it all in a notebook. I haven't really made it official yet. Yeah. Like, so this is mm -hmm. the direction I'm going. Mm -hmm. well, it, sounds well, it sounds like, like you have a great start. Mm -hmm. You're organized anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I met with um, my daughter's fifth grade teacher, Missy Dorr. Mm -hmm. uh, she was going through the process with the lady from Shields Valley. So I met with the lady from Shields Valley a year ago and she kind of talked me through what I needed. And then um, I met with my daughter's teacher and then we've emailed a little bit. But yeah, it's just, it's, it is interesting trying to read through it by yourself. Mm -hmm. And then going to the, the one class in February with Kate Portis, was, it was really good. So she would look at my stuff and just take a pen and write and just evidence, evidence, 
those that, this, that made me rethink kind of how I'm approaching it. It's not a lesson plan. That's what someone said. Don't write it like a lesson plan. Yeah. That's not what they're looking for. So that was really helpful, that just that mm -hmm. one statement. It's a different kind of writing. And I was talking to Sarah Dahl at the high school about this last week. And it's like, it's not creative. It's not flowery. You don't need an introduction and a conclusion. You know, you, it's, it's, it's way more analytical than we're used to writing. Um, and it really, it really is just sort of describing what, what t good teaching looks like. Um, and it, you can't put all that flowery language in there because you don't have the word count for it. <laughs> I can remember like I had to cut out almost an entire page of one of my um, components and it was like you got really good with words. <laughs> yeah, getting succinct. Yeah, getting succinct. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Was it Judy Vincent in Shields Valley that you, that you walked, talked with? No, nope. oh, I almost thought of her name. Okay, I wonder if she was true. doing. She was a K eight teacher, so yeah. she was doing a generalist. Uh huh. It wasn't. I remember what her name. Hmm. I can't think of her name now. No. Um, but I remember meeting her at um, a conference, and she was working on submitting again. And um, she was she'd been kind of frustrated, but she's like, "I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it." Um, she was a, a K-8 teacher in Shields Valley. She was really great. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't think of her name. Um, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, she had passed. She passed, I think, the first time by, like, two points. And then the lady from, they, had really, they were doing the same thing. So they spent a lot of time together on Missy Dora at Morningstar. Mm -hmm. And then Missy Dora had to almost get, like, a 3.7 on her component one test oh. and she, oh. she didn't so she has to go back and look at where some other areas to get more points this year yeah that's rough yeah that's um, almost like a perfect score yeah yeah, yeah absolutely so yep we get, we uh work better when we're together for sure mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely all right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Susan. And you and I are going to get together on Wednesday. So if you think of anything else I can, I can answer questions for, we can talk about it more. And um, like I said, we're going to, we're recording this right now um, and we'll share the link out. So you'll get a chance to, to go back and watch something if you want to um, okay. and just reach out if we can help you with anything. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're in Livingston so I can come and talk to you. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> it was nice meeting you, Susan. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kim. I think that went well. Yeah. <laughs> it helped that we had like a student with a lot of uh, prior knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> we nailed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the meeting. I, I think if we all leave it, it'll end it and we'll record yeah. it. Okay. And the markers. Okay. Perfect. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.